It's got, you know, you got to admit there aren't, how many other fields would have a song <laughs> like that dedicated to them that you can dance to, you know? I'm a urologist, no, I don't think we'd be able <laughs> to do that. But um, I show this because, first of all, it is, it is fun, it's entertaining. But it also, on the other hand, I think it gives some very interesting messages. First of all, that all we study are dinosaurs. Secondly, that the only people interested in it are children, like yourselves. Um, that uh, the people who study it are basically we, all we do is you go out in the field with strange dorky hats and study dinosaurs out there. Um, and males are the people who are studying it. And I think one, a lot of the reasons I wrote my book was to get us away from some of these misconceptions about what paleontologist does, what we study, who we are, what tools we use. And I want to really stress and why we're important. Okay. So again, you know, I, every time I tell somebody I'm a paleontologist, besides the cool, we get, oh, you must study dinosaurs. And a lot of my colleagues do study dinosaurs. And dinosaurs are very, very cool things in their own way. But most paleontologists don't, myself included, because what we study is everything that has ever lived and has left some sort of trace of themselves behind. So this is a, from a wonderful book published by the Paleontological Research Institution uh, for, for children. This is the life of the Ordovician, and I've got a couple of pieces of Ordovician rock back there to show you. But there are no dinosaurs here. In fact, there's only, this is a fish-like animal. That's the uh, organisms I did my doctoral thesis on, I still work on. These are giant shells here. And as we'll talk about, these are the kinds of trilobites, but no dinosaurs. This is 450 million years ago, long before the dinosaurs existed. So what do most of us really study? Well, again, uh, anything that could leave a remainder of itself behind. So clams, these things called brachiopods, which look like clams, but they're actually totally unrelated, very common things. Uh, these relatives of the modern-day uh, octopus and squid and nautilus, uh, various ancient crustaceans, starfish, these trilobites, all of these are the kinds of things you would often find in the rock, but again, not with dinosaurs. So what do paleontologists study? We study any living thing that leaves behind fossils. We study what fossils tell us about life on Earth in the ancient past, because this is the record of that. We study how and why life has changed over time, in other words, the study of evolution. And one thing that I've gotten very interested in, a lot of us in the field sometimes called conservation paleontology, is what can studying what has happened in the past give us as a guide to the future? So, of course, the next question is, what's a fossil? And paleontologists are people who study fossils. And fossils are living, are what living things leave behind after they die. And they include your, you know, what things you usually assume, the bones and the teeth here. This is a mastodon. Actually, this is one on display at Wheaton College, I believe, the perimastodon. We also have shells. And I, you can sort of divide fossils up, uh, body, your body parts, into two things. Your hard parts and your soft parts. And your hard parts are going to be your bones and your teeth and your shells and so on. They're usually what gets left behind. And the vast majority of fossils oops, sorry, are these. So a clam shell, a snail shell, the shell of a sea urchin. And these are the things we use to study how the ocean lot changes in the ocean have happened over time. But not only do we have animal life, but plant life gets left behind too. So leaves, like this leaf here from the Maison Creek, and you may recognize right away, that's a fern. And I've got a couple of specimens in the back there. And you have a wonderful display of material from here down the hall, which you can go look at later. But also pollen. If you ever wondered why you sneeze when you breathe in too much pollen, you can look at the, what pollen grains look like. But pollen grains are really important because they record the climate, what plants were 
there relate to climate, and that tells us how climate has changed over time. There's in a whole subdiscipline of paleontology of people who look at pollen grains. But also, and this is something my own area, of, one of my own areas of interest, is footprints and trails and burrows. We call these trace fossils. So that here's a modern day horseshoe crab, but you'll notice it leaves this trail behind it. That can preserve and tell us what the animal did. These are various, uh, where two, various worm like animals have moved through the, uh, the sediment. And this is an incredibly common fossil in Illinois. And this is a footprint of a three, of a dinosaur. But these footprints, these tracks, these trails, they tell us how behavior has evolved over time. So anybody interested in these in animal behavior would be interested in how uh, looking at this through time. So I like to say more than anything else, we are time travelers. Now we don't do this obviously with a TARDIS or with H.G. Wells' famous time machine. But mentally, we do make travels in time. And how do we do that? Well, that gets to why we study fossils in the first place. So here is a, a wonderful trilobite. First of all, we ask, what was life like long ago? Where did the organisms for today come from? So here, this hawk was in my backyard a couple of years back. And here is Archaeopteryx from the Jurassic. You can see the feathers here. And it is, on the one hand, clearly a bird, but it also has teeth, which modern birds don't have. And if you didn't have the feathers, you'd think it was a dinosaur, and they're all feathered dinosaurs. So we know that birds are dinosaurs, though I basically like to keep the two separate as kind of when I talk about them. Birds are birds and dinosaurs are dinosaurs, even though birds are descended from dinosaurs. So where did organisms decay come from? Here is again a reconstruction of the Maison Creek. So how has, do modern organisms have their origins in life of the past? But also has ecology of time changed? Here's this forest here, a swamp in Illinois. You see any flowers? There were no flowers yet. There were, these were, there were some uh, pine-like trees, but things would be icopods, ferns, things like that. So it's a forest, but it's not a forest like we see today. And again, we don't have swamps like this here in Illinois today. We also have environmental change. So here is the late, oh, sorry, we used to using this clicker here. Here's the late Carboniferous, 305 million years ago. This is basically when the Maison Creek, that forest swamp formed. Chicago was somewhere around here at that time. And here is what it looked like here 21,000 years ago, where where you were sitting had a kilometer of ice over your head. So we know that the geology of the Earth has changed. This is the time, I keep doing that, so this is the time of Pangaea when it was all together, and there was an ice age down to the south. And this is a time of massive ice age. So we know geology has changed over time. We know climate has changed over time. We know that rocks have hit the Earth. We know all sorts of things. We know what happens more than any other field of science when things go bad. When there is a physical change in the world, we know how life responded to it. We give you the evidence and we look at how life responded. And of course, extinction. I like to point out that this is paleontology's major contribution to human thought. If you think about, you know, Earth is no longer the center of the solar system. The solar system is no longer the center of the galaxy, and so on. But, and man is descended from, from non-human animals. But the idea that something that was alive no longer existed was not accepted until the 18th century, until Cuvier showed it was there were extinct things. The idea of extinction automatically introduced the idea of change of life over time. That's in a major intellectual change. So we don't see dinosaurs anymore, except for the birds, yes, I know. And we, and we know that this happened because 66 million years ago, there was a massive rock that hit the Earth around what is now the Yucatan, and that caused the extinction. And so a tremendous amount of our research since then 
has been on extinctions. What causes them? What happens? What are the lessons for extinctions of the past for what's going on today? We have had five major extinctions. There's one going on today. The sixth extinction is called. Is it the same or is it different than what went, went on back in the past? So this is one. We sometimes talk about these five major ones. I like to think about this one. This one happened only 10, 15,000 years ago. Where you are sitting now, wandering around here, were beasts that looked like this, giant ground sloths or, or mammoths. And we know that these are called the megafauna. I mean, if you've ever seen a, a live sloth, they're not big. You go to the Field Museum, you'll see how tall these are. These were, you know, 10 feet tall animals. And we don't have elephants wandering around today in this area. So many giant mammals and some smaller ones died out about 10,000 years ago in North and South America, probably about 30,000 years ago, 40,000 years ago in um, Australia. And you want to get an argument going among various practitioners in science, you know, anthropologists and archaeologists and paleontologists. You argue about what caused this. And there are those who say, well, you know, the ice ages did end. The world got warmer. But that happened many times before that. Ice came and went. Maybe it was because we now started to have humans in, many, in these places, which is probably the predominant cause. But maybe it was a combination. Elephants, you know, for things like a mammoth may have had a very long generation time. And all you needed is that little extra pressure to create the extinction. But this is something we need to know about. If there's an extinction today, this one's very relevant to what's going on. So let me talk, give you an idea of some of the ones right here. This is a, I went to uh, the Hemingway Museum, the former Hemingway Museum in, in uh, Oak Park, and they had on display a piece of tooth, a mammoth tooth. And they said, this is from Forest Home Cemetery, courtesy of the Forest Park Public Library. And I went over to the Forest Park Public Library, and there on display there were mammoth teeth and a mammoth tusk. And these were found in about 1855 in a gravel bank that was built, that was put in to, make, to find some gravel for making a railroad spur. So right in Forest Park, but not just there, there are mammoths Mastodons and mammoths all through this area. So I'll talk a little bit more of that in a minute. So how did I become a paleontologist? Now this is a, when I started to write my book, my thought was my story would be unusual. So let me talk about my story, then when I, I'll talk about a little bit of what I thought everybody else would do. So I didn't want to be a paleontologist when I was a child. I wanted to be an astronomer. I, this was my telescope, which I still own. But I grew up in the Bronx. There's not a lot of stuff you can see from the Bronx. You can see the moon and the planets, some um, pretty much what I can see now from my home in Oak Park. And I also discovered, and this is about when I was starting high school, that to be an astronomer, you need to be an astrophysicist, which means you need to be a physicist, you need to be a mathematician. You need to be able to think about the universe with math as a metaphor for it. And that's a skill a little bit too far for me. So I went to the uh, planetary, you know, when I was a kid, I went to the, um, well, two things happened. First, I went to a lecture about a guy who talked about a time when the Mediterranean dried up due to plate tectonics. I said, that's really cool. I'd never heard of that idea before. Geology sounds like a fun field. Then I went to the aquarium in New York, and I saw the white whales, and I said, oh, that's cool. Maybe I should become a biologist. So I went to Columbia University as an undergraduate, and I registered initially as a biology major. And my first course, the textbook was called The Molecular Biology of the Gene. And it was all molecules and chemistry, and I'm going, this is not what I'm interested in. <laughs> so I switched over to uh, geology. I also, at that time, um, my dad was a New York City school teacher. I was eligible for financial aid. I had a work study job. Initially, I worked at a, um, a blood bank in New York City. Now, what are you going to let a 17-year-old kid do at a blood bank? <laughs> Nothing, because if he makes a mistake, somebody dies. So they, they, I would walk in and say, oh, why don't you just study? OK, fine. And then I read an article in Natural History magazine by 
this fellow here, Niles Eldridge, about trilobites. In fact, this specific trilobite here. Um, and Niles is famous because he came up with this thing called the theory of punctuated equilibrium along with Stephen Jay Gould. And this is the 50th anniversary of that theory. And so I told my mom, hey, that's kind of an interesting article. And she said, call him up and see if he has a job. <laughs> I called him up. It turns out uh, one of my colleagues, uh, uh, somebody I knew, now two years ahead of me, his father had a work study, he had a work study job, but his father wrote a book that made a lot of money, and he lost his job. So I got it instead. So he had a job for me, and I have to thank, even years later, I still thank my mom. You have to listen to your mom. <laughs> and your dad, too, but your dad, mom's good, too. So I became a geology major with a work study job at the American Museum. And I had, you know, and Niles worked on trilobites, and I got to just started right off there, almost basically from scratch. After graduating uh, Columbia, I did my master's at the University of Rochester, a PhD in Chicago. Uh, I was at UIC from 1982, retired in 2020, but I'm still Professor Emeritus, still my office there, and I still have telescopes there, and I still can't see a thing from where I am. <laughs> so. So when, when I start, I was, the reason I was getting to this is that when I wrote, started writing my book, I figured, okay, my story is going to be unusual. Most of the paleontologists I know, they'll say, oh, you know, I always loved fossils as a kid, and I love dinosaurs, and I just decided to do that for my life. Well, every seven-year-old says they love dinosaurs, and they want to do that as they grow up. Not, but most of them don't stick with it. Or I grew up in the Cincinnati area or upstate New York where there's fossils all over the place, just go down to a stream bed. And I just started collecting about a hobby. And it turns out some of my colleagues did that. But a lot of them did not become paleontologists until college, at the very least, because again, they, had, they started off with a major in art or music or something else. Had that one teacher, that one professor, that one class that got them excited about the subject. And they changed what they were doing. So it was very interesting to get, the, so I tend to get to tell a lot of these stories in the book. So what do we study? Again, we don't all study dinosaurs. This is, um, here is a reconstruction of the animal that I did my doctoral thesis on, a sea scorpion or a eurypterid. And from there to there is uh, about two meters. These are Silurian animals, the long extinct. Here is me being threatened by a plushy version of it over here. Um, I actually have a paper that I'm going to be talking about next two weeks from now at, the, at, the, at a conference where I'm going to show that this is wrong, how they have the limbs, because this thing can't, you know, you know T-Rex, you ever see these pictures of T-Rex? Its arms are too short to reach its mouth. Well, in this reconstruction here, its arms are too long to reach its mouth. And turns out that's because they got the other legs are all in the wrong place in this reconstruction. So we're sh showing after 100, see the last, 100, over 100 years of the wrong reconstruction of this animal. But anyway, that's, uh, so giant sea scorpions, very cool animals. Oh, sorry. Um, another area of interest, I'm going to focus mostly on my own, is um, ancient sense organs. Now here's a, a, a little fact you may not have known. If you go out and you look at a katydid or a cricket out in your yard, you get a very close look. You'll see on their legs, there's this little oval area. That is their ears. They have ear, their ears are out on their forelegs. Turns out, this is um, from what's called the Green River Formation, famous fossil site out in Colorado and Utah. And you look at the forelimbs right there, you see the same thing. So this was the we were able to establish for the first time that insect hearing in crickets went back at least that far. And I have a project right now with some colleagues who are trying to find ancient moths, because about half of moth species have ears also, basically to hear bats coming at them. So we're trying to find ears for that. But ancient sense organs, and that relates to the ideas about ancient behavior. How did organisms hear about their environment? Um, this is something I, the paper is just about to go uh, be finished on this. Um, I have a fossil, uh, not a very good fossil of this in, in the back of the room. This 
fossil here is from the Maison Creek, or pink, if you're from that town, it's Mazan. Mazan Creek. And there's, a lo again, a lovely display out there of that. It's where our state fossil, the Tully Monster, is from. And there's a nice example of it on display here. And um, since 1975, this was described as a jellyfish with this at the top and that at the bottom. And working with colleagues of mine who are specialists in fossil jellyfish and looking at thousands and thousands of specimens, because this is an incredibly common fossil from the Maison Creek, it was interpreted upside down all these years. And what was thought to be at the bottom, the top here, is actually the bottom. And it's a sea anemone. It's an incredibly common sea anemone. It's the only common sea anemone in the entire fossil record. But it's, it was upside down. It was just a matter of, and it wasn't like new material. It was just looking at it and going, oh, wait a minute. That makes no sense as a jellyfish. It makes perfect sense as an anemone. Where do we study fossils? Well, I like to say if you're to do, like doing science and you like being outdoors and not stuck in a lab with chemicals and things like that, this is a good field to be in. And many of my colleagues, not me, but many of my colleagues, this is what they really love best. I enjoy it, which is going out in the field. So here is actually uh, me collecting some Pennsylvanian age fossils in um, Ogilvy, near Ogilvy, Illinois, um, in a road cut near Illinois Valley Community College. And cross fingers, within the next five years, there will be a fossil park established as right adjacent to that area with the efforts myself and a couple of my colleagues out that way, where the public can go with groups to collect. This will be in a former quarry that's right next to that area there, Cross Fingers. Um, this is the, on the other hand, this is a sea cliff here, and this is an area over by the, in, in Newfoundland. Oop. So let me sort of do this more locally. So this is the, another view of the Ordovician. A little less cartoonish version of the art. Again, showing you here the giant nautiloids, the, the corals, bryozoans, trilobite. Here is a eurypterid in the back, a crinoid. And again, I have a couple of small pieces of rock of that age back here. And those rocks, those specimens, are from just west of here. Uh, this is a quarry here. Um, in Sycamore, Illinois. And this is my taking a class out there. And all throughout near Dixon and Rockford and so on, there are rocks of the Ordovician age, and they represent the time when we were in a big of a shallow ocean. So I like to say, if you were here in the middle of the Ordovician, 450, 450 460 million years ago, you would need to have some snorkeling gear or some scuba equipment to get around, or at least to be on a boat. No dinosaurs. If you jump ahead to 40, 420 million years ago, this is the Silurian, it looks kind of the same. I mean, one of the things we recognize is that most of the periods of time, although there's change over at the species level, many of the major groups were still there. And so we see, um, Again, there's the nautiloids, there's some corals, solitary corals here, and some of the other uh, nautiloids swimming in the back. And again, this is what it looked like right here, right where you're sitting 420 million years ago. In fact, this is the uh, bedrock of the Chicago area. So these, are, these here, this is a piece of rock from this area, that's what's called the Thornton Quarry, and I'll come to where that is, but you see each of those little pieces there? Those are really badly preserved brachiopods, and I've got a piece of one of them back there. But it comes from Thornton Quarry. If you drive, uh, drive the to, uh, this is basically Halstead in 29480 with a Tri-State Expressway course. There's a huge quarry there. It's part of the um, Deep Tunnel Project. It's, it's a fossil reef. At one point, that was a reef in the middle of the ocean. And so this entire area which had shallow oceans. And you could, there are a very number, number of places around here. Almost, there are quarries, um, I think it's still there, with Barbara Corner's quarry out in, in uh, Bolingbroke. There's a number of quarries around this area. Almost all are in Silurian dolomites from this age. So that's the bedrock of the area. That's what we put built the foundations of our buildings into. 
Jumping ahead, I'll, I'll just mention the jump ahead is, this is what's local. There is no place in the world where the geological time is, every part of Earth history is represented by rock. There are gaps in time of all sizes. So we are jumping here from 420 to 305 because the rocks in between have either never been deposited or they were removed by erosion. So here we have the Pennsylvanian, the time of the Mezon Creek, and we have tropical swamps and forests that were buried and became coal. You'll see here some nice tree. And there's a nice example of that on display down the hall there of the bark of the tree. And I brought some of the leaves around here. But also nearby, so here we are. Here's a, a diorama in the, at the Field Museum of this time. Again, uh, giant um, dragonflies and here's the trees. But this is actually Mazan Creek itself. And um, we were able to uh, alloc have somebody from, uh, to get access to the original site and collect the fossils there. Oops, sorry. So fossil in Mazan Creek. This is actually one of my favorite things. Um, so this is a number of years back with a group of students. We went to a quarry um, out near Morris. And you always, it's hard, to, because the Ice Age has covered most of the area, and because of construction, farmland, it's hard to find areas you can collect. We have to go to quarries. So we went to this quarry out near Morris, and it was described as being all limestones. And there is limestone here. But then we noticed this whole thing, and this is, uh, sandstone at the bottom, shale at the middle, very fine mudstone at the top, with more limestone on top. And this is like, what is that? How, how the heck do we get this big body of mud and sand surrounded by limestone? And then this particular graduate student said, that's a cave. And what happened is, at the beginning of the Pennsylvanian times, there was an ice age in, South, in the, what is now South America, Africa. Sea levels dropped as the water went into the ice. All the areas that had been covered by these shallow oceans had rain on them. And just like they do Mammoth Cave today, caves formed. And then the rivers came in and they filled the caves. And it turns out all through this entire body of rock were plant fossils, including this, doesn't look like much here, but that's a conifer, and it's one of the very oldest conifers in the world. So we went there without any idea what we'd find. We just, it was total serendipity. What is, what is that, what do we got? Turns out we've found some of the oldest preserved uh, spore pollen, which is the coating on spores, the oldest chitin, which is the coating, uh, we find scorpions in this stuff, um, evidence for high for fires. It's an amazing sight. And again, I knew nothing about caves before I went out there, or, cave paleontology. So I got interested in that subject. So since then, I've also gone out with, this is one of my uh, former graduate students here, and you can see watching my head here. Um, we've gone into caves and tried to understand how things get preserved in caves and the, fossil pro the processes of preservation in caves and the impact of caves on the fossil record. Whole new area of research for me, totally started off by serendipity. And that's one of the fun things about doing science. When you find something like, nobody's ever done this before? Ooh, that should be fun. And I, you learn new things. So we do stuff in the field. But we have been collecting fossils for hundreds of years. And many of them end up in museums. So the study I did on the sea anemone, those fossils were not fossils I collected. Those are fossils that were in places like the Field Museum, collected years ago, or even currently, by many of the local amateur and avocational paleontologists in the Chicago area. For example, the group called the Earth Science Club of Northern Illinois, which I've also joined. These people have been collecting in the Maison Creek and areas like that for, for decades, since especially the highlight of this is back in the 50s and 60s. They put their stuff into the museum. You can pull the drawer out, and you can look at it there. You don't have to go out and dig it up yourself. 
So all these cases, this is actually the ALP body museum, from here to here, drawer after drawer after drawer of drawer fossils. And so if you want to learn about stuff, you know, you go to the museum. This is where, as you know, Sue, who is now upstairs, if you haven't seen it yet, the new exhibit is amazing. You see Sue there, and that's, of course that brings people in. This is uh, Anomal Karras, again, I'm being threatened here. Um, that's a famous Cambrian form, but museums are the storehouse of our knowledge of these things. And um, amazing places to spend time in. I'm a research associate at Field Museum. Still go there sometimes to go look at stuff. Uh, and of course, we study fossils in our offices and laboratories. So I have, I've been sitting in that same seat for four years. Um, the, um, I have a huge library of my own uh, in there. I have computers that I can look up. There are huge there are databases I can look at, online databases. And we are a high-tech field in that we use uh, various big data methods. Uh, we also have, this is my microscope set up here. Um, this costs more than my car did. Uh, it has these, and this is a picture of a fossil spider in amber I was able to take with that microscope. Incredible detail and so on. So we spend a lot of time with using often with very high-tech equipment. Uh, there's a lot of people who work out at Argonne National Laboratory putting fossil specimens on the synchrotron. Uh, there's a whole bunch of spectroscopy methods. We are a high-tech field. We, we use it every method we can. So uh, there was a talk we had in my department just this week about a, a, about from a young investigator who's using fossil molecules. Proteins preserve, carbohydrates preserve, lipids preserve. And we can use those to study the history of life. And she's also looking at the possibility of finding life in other planets, looking at those methods. But using the very highest technology we have. So it is high tech. So again, here is here's argon. And people use stuff at the beam line. Here are some fossil insects, uh, ants that were gone out of amber. That's the kind of detail you can get using this kind of equipment. Uh, we can do CT scanning, basically fancy versions of what happens when you go in and get a medical thing done, to look what's inside the rock without having to chisel or spend all the time you used to do chiseling it with the risk of damaging it. And once you've CT scanned it, you can then make 3D models and things like that and start playing with it. It's incredible what is available now, much more than when I was a, when I was a graduate student. We used to have to you know, sit there with, I still do this sometimes, with the needles and the pins and stuff like that. But this is the, this is the cutting edge for, for our field right now, technologically. And we use, as I said, we use big data. So there's something called, for example, the paleobiology database. This is, if you want to look up where is every triceratops from that's ever been discovered, you go to the paleobiology database, type in triceratops, and it'll give you a map. And then you can click on it and figure out where those localities are. It's free, it's open access, it's community driven. Uh, it has, this is an older photo of it, but it has hundreds of thousands of references and species and things like that. It's an incredible database for fossils. And then based on this kind of thing, we can do analyses. So this is kind of old, but this was done by my, uh, my doctoral advisor, Jack Sikoski. Um, this is probably the most repeated, yes? The database, uh, who has input into this? Uh, you have to be an authorized rep enterer. So it's not open. It's not an open, no, it's not open. It's not like Wikipedia. <laughs> it's, 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 I am an authorized, I am an authorizer. And what, if I have a student who wants to enter data, I can tell them, get them permission to do that. It's highly vetted. It has its problems because data is data. But <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually, no, it's a community database. Thank you. So. Um, this is probably the most shown in every geological meeting uh, picture. Let me just give you a basic idea of what you're looking at. Here's geologic time, going in this case from left to right. Sometimes they run it from right to left, which makes you crazy. It's got to, there's no consistency. But anyway, so old, young, today, 600 million years ago. This is the number of marine families. So you have a species belongs to a genus, belongs to a family. This is the number of families over time. And this is, I like to call this the gestalt, the big picture of the fossil record of the life on Earth. 
We see here in the Cambrian, the first ramp up. The Cambrian radiation or Cambrian explosion as some people call it. When all the major groups we are familiar with started to come into existence or become known in the fossil record. This big jump here, the great autoversion biodiversity expansion, the Gobi, when we got all the things that we see in the Ordovician seas today. This plateau and the rest of the Paleozoic, but, and then this big drop in the, in the end of the Permian, and then the rise up. And you'll notice it labels one, two, three, four, five. Those are our major extinction events. One at the end of the Ordovician, several actually at the end of the Devonian. Some people call this the mother of mass extinctions at the end of the Permian, where, or life, when life nearly died. Another one at the end of the Jurassic, and of course the one we're most familiar with at the end of the Cretaceous, which wiped out the, <clears throat> the non-avian dinosaurs. That's the word, the phrase my colleagues use, so <laughs> we know we're not talking about birds. And plus one more, of course, uh, the modern anthropogenic six extinction. And I, flogging another author's book, I'll do that. If you have never read this, this is a Pulitzer Prize winner by Elizabeth Colbert. Uh, the Sixth Extinction, an absolutely wonderful book and depressing as heck because she goes over all the things that are going on today. But it, it is a, a, a really wonderful book. And again, talks about fossils and paleontology and the concept. This is actually a, an earlier book by the same title. But this is the one that's, I think, gotten a lot of attention. The modern human-produced mass extinction that we are seeing today. So. We are having extinctions, we've had these extinctions in the past, the big five, the one with the megafauna, but we also have extinctions today. I got an email from a young lady this week from school studying the dodo extinction. She wanted to know what caused it. But the dodo is extinct 1693. They got eaten to death. They're nice flightless birds on an isolated island, and the sailors said, good, place, good, good thing to get some protein. Um, the passenger pigeon, Extinction 1914, that's Martha, the last passenger pigeon to die in, in Cincinnati Zoo in 1914. Uh, I occasionally go to the Field Museum. They have an exhibit on the first floor there uh, with, with passenger pigeons in it and just make homage to them. There used to be billions of them darkening the skies overhead, wiped out by hunting. Uh, the thylacine, the Tasmanian wolf, extinct 1934. There's still movies of this thing. And probably the white rhino may, may or may not be gone really soon. So this is what's going on today. So what will we know about this extinction? We have these big extinctions, right? These big five extinctions, the one. What will we know about extinctions in the future? And so one of my areas of research is asking what it will be left behind. And it turns out the vast majority of things that are going extinct today will not leave a fossil record behind them. They are things that live on islands, or they're small, or for other reasons they are in the wrong environment. Uh, the estimate I came up, we came up with is something like 13% of extinct mammal species will have a fossil record. Much less for things like amphibians and reptiles. So we won't even know these things ever existed in the future. But even more like that, what will we see? Well, it turns out that something like 80% to 90% of the mammalian biomass today is humans and cows and pigs. And a vast majority of the avian biomass is chickens. And so what we're going to find, yeah, what we're going to find in the fossils of the future, the fossil record of the far future, is going to be chicken bones, cow bones, uh, pigs, various in various pieces. If it's any deer, it may some occasionally a deer with the head over here and the rest of the body over there. Um, and all these aligned human skeletons, which will really confuse the people. So the fossil record of the future is going to be not the fossil record of the past. And this ties into what we sometimes call the Anthropocene concept. The idea that the most recent parts of Earth history are dominated by humans, to the extent that some colleagues propose we should have a new name for that. That's, again, a very controversial issue, but that's a, well, something we talk about. 
Of course, I'm retired, but we are also, also teachers. Um, I, again, worked for 38 years at UIC as a faculty member, and this was one of my paleontology classes here. We're actually playing a board game called about fossil preservation, seeing how that worked. And this was my TA. And here he is again over here. And these are my most recent group of graduate students. Uh, these two, unfortunately, did not finish, but he is now doing his postdoc in Poland. And I'm hoping he very soon he'll be uh, doing a postdoc in, in uh, Stanford, but I'm crossing fingers on that. Um, so we teach, not just in a, form, uh, in a classroom, but in an informal basis, too. So this is uh, something I did with the um, Picking Notabart Nature Museum a few years back, where we took the keys, kids to the, uh, the shoreline of Lake Michigan, and there were these big blocks of limestone they use as revetments to protect the shoreline. And a lot of them are from Indiana, they have lots of fossils in them. So I'm pointing out the, the fossils here in the, in the rock. Um, and we have hobbies. Now let me just go background on that. One of the things that drives, one of my colleagues, this is I'm always crazy, people go, oh, you guys, you're professors, you're not in the real world. Yeah, we are. <laughs> we have jobs, we have kids we gotta send to college, we got cars we have to pay for, we have homes we have to, you know, we are in the real world. We have to do everything that everybody else does. It's just we have our, our job kinds to be a little bit more fun sometimes. You know, you know two years after retirement, I'm still doing it. Um, but we also have hobbies. So I, I collect Amer uh, or run American Flyer trains. I'm also, strangely enough, the world's expert on the little engine that could. Um, the, you know, you always see the, the story written by Waddy Piper. Never existed. In fact, the story goes about 30 years before that story was ever written. I have a whole article I've written about this, this thing. But anyway, so I have a whole collection of little engine that could stuff. So who are they? Who are we? I'm going to guess, get to, the other thing I want to get to is the image that we have. Not just what we do, but the image. OK, paleontologists, there are the fictional ones. Most notably, of course, whoops, sorry, Sam Neill as, as Alan Grant in, in the, is the first Jurassic Park movie. And I love the fact that they did have Laura Dern as a, a, a female paleobotanist. And one of my good friends is uh, friends are female paleobotanists, so I'm very happy to, to see that representation there. And the one that really embarrasses me, because every time you tell a paleontologist, they go, oh, just like Ross. <laughs> and this is Ross Geller here. What does a paleontologist need a beeper for? It's like dinosaur emergencies. Anyway, you know, you, you look at the history of when Ross does paleontology in the TV show. I'm sorry, how that guy got a job, kept a job, didn't get uh, uh, charged with sexual harassment, I have no idea. Anyway, but you get asked that quite a lot. So, or you get said, <laughs> just like Indiana Jones! And anybody see the Tribune this past Sunday? Yep. Front page? Yep. Paul Serino, the Indiana Jones of paleontology. I don't like that association. First of all, he's an archeologist. Secondly, here he is stealing cultural artifacts. Thirdly, he kills people. Fourthly, he does, we can go on. He doesn't teach his classes. Actually, he harasses his students. I mean, it's actually, you know, not a good model, but that seems to be the easy thing to come up with. Oh, just like Indy. Oh, not Indiana Jones either. So here's some real paleontologists going back to Darwin. Uh, there was one point there was an exhibit at the Field Museum of Darwin's office. They had his geology hammer, which I would have given somebody money to hold just for a minute. And they had, um, uh, he's collected fossils in South America. Uh, famously, Cope and Marsh, who are famous for the, um, the bone wars fought between them for collecting the dinosaurs in the 19th century. Sometimes called the real Indiana Jones. <laughs> Roy Chapman Andrews, and I would read his books when I was a kid quite a bit. He would do uh, collecting the dinosaur eggs in the Mongolia, things like that, of what he collected. And he had to rifle for a reason because that was the era of the warlords in China, and it was really not safe, and bandits. And he was a professor in my alma mater at Beloit. At Beloit, that's correct, yeah. My son's alma mater also. Uh, George Gaylord Simpson. 
uh, at American Museum and in Arizona, who started the field towards, he wrote books about paleontology, which had no pictures of fossils in it. They're all about evolution and what job paleontologists, so the founder of what we call paleobiology. Uh, my grand professor, Stephen Jay Gould, known for his many books and his uh, theory, theoretical ideas, um, sort of sometimes called the modern day Martian Cope, but Jack Horner and Bacher uh, often consulted on the Jurassic Park movies, and you often see them. Um, my good colleagues and friends, uh, Susan Kidwell at the University of Chicago and Kay Berensmeyer at, uh, the, at the National Museum of Natural History. Sometimes Kay is sometimes called the mother of taphonomy, the mother of the study of fossil preservation. And I have to put in Thomas Jefferson. Uh, he didn't know it at the time, but he described, he wrote something called a memoir of certain, on the discovery of certain bones of a quadruped of the clawed kind in the western parts of Virginia in 1799. So he described the first North American ground sloth. He thought it was some sort of carnivore, but um, this was actually, so sometimes we can, Jefferson didn't realize what they were. But one of the reasons he sponsored the Lewis and Clark expeditions is because he wanted to go find things like that out west. Mary Anning. We have to give, yes, yes. yes. You do something about Mary here, right? A presentation about Mary. Uh, Mary, yes. So um, I was just very recently at the uh, Museum of Comparative Paleontology and in, in, in Anatomy in Paris, and they have specimens collected by Mary Anning on display. It was like, ooh. So she was, uh, she lacked formal scientific training. She lived along the coast of England in a place called Lyme Regis, and there's some wonderful books about her. Ignore the movie, it's not, we don't know anything about her personal life, just can say that. And uh, she secured many fine specimens of ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs, fossil fish, sold them. Many of the fossils, uh, like this one here, were new to science. So she was uh, what we would kind of call today a uh, commercial paleontologist to some extent, but she also knew the scientific. She corresponded with Cuvier, people like that. There was now a museum in her name. And again, there's this new movie out with Kate Winslet and Sasha Ronan, which has nothing to do with where she really was. Um, meet some of meet my, my other, my colleagues and friends here. Uh, Lisa Park Bausch, who I, I've published papers with. She went uh, with me to a toy train show in, in, in Massachusetts here. And Lisa is an expert on life in the ancient lakes. Uh, Lisa White, who's at the, uh, we're holding up some nice stuffies here. I have a whole bunch of fossil stuffies from the PRI. Um, and Lisa is an expert on ocean life and uh, very involved in education at, in San Francisco. She's at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, Dina Smith Nufio, from, who has a Mexican background. And Dina and I have worked together on fossil insects. And she is now, okay, I got to tell you very quickly, Nina's story. Dina, Growing up Latina, uh, was told, oh, you can't do science. You shouldn't be able to do science. You've got to do something else in your life. She is now uh, one of the directors of the National Science Foundation. So poo-poo uh, on that. Uh, Pedro Marenko here, whose family is from Guatemala. Um, and again, he's, he works on some of the early issues of early life. Um, these are two colleagues of mine, Tom Hulse and Jess Theodore. Tom is one of the go-to people about dinosaurs that people talk to nowadays. He's written quite a lot about T-Rex. Jess Theodore works on fossil mammals. And one of the reasons I bring them up because I just, this is just a fun thing to talk about. So, uh, some you get, sometimes you get great ideas just from things on Facebook. A colleague of ours asked the question, are brachiopods, those shelled animals, kosher? He had that question from, an, from a, gra a student in his class. Are these brachiopods kosher? And of course, all of us went, no, they're shelled. They're shelled. You can't eat shelled animals. They're not kosher. And uh, Jess here, who, like myself, is Jewish, said, oh, you know, she gets asked that about her fossil mammals by her relatives. Like, you know, no, Jess, is this kosher? So we decided to investigate this and ask, how would, we know, how would a paleontologist answer the question, using the data we have, if a particular fossil organism was kosher or not? So that, first of all, meant my going to a deep dive on what the kosher rules were. 
Then secondly, how would you look at a fossil and say, oh, is that a kosher animal or not? What evidence? So for example, we have fossil fishes that have fins and scales. Good. Dinosaurs, no. Dino, dino burgers would not have been kosher. So we wrote a paper called Jurassic Pork. <laughs> or what could a Jewish, Jewish time traveler eat? And it was, it was kind of the, one of the fun things about it is we were trying to get away from this idea that the only interaction between people who are interested in the Bible and people who are interested in paleontology is going to be Genesis. So let's say, let's go to Leviticus and Deuteronomy and see if we can find there. Maybe we can find some common ground. So again, we just sort of go over, here are some common things we eat and what, what, what is the fossil record of them and can we tell, for example, do they chew cud? And of cloven hooves. Um, this is my friend Ann Weil, who works on dinosaurs and mammals. Shown, she does a, quite a lot of education efforts. And finally, I really have to do, no, next to last, I'll talk about artists. Art, I have no artistic abilities at all. I draw terribly. But I rely on the artists out there to take the ideas we have and put them into reality. And Ray, who was out at, uh, in Alaska, is one of my personal favorites. He is just delightful artwork. Uh, and uh, they're scientifically, they're kind of surrealistic, but scientific. You get an idea from his style from here, but they're always scientifically accurate. And also, I do mention again now uh, to, to the, the, our, our local amateurs. So here is uh, Francis Tully. That's the fossil there. There's an example of that on display in the hall there. This is the Tully monster. And that is our current view of what it may look like. There's big debate about what this thing was. But that's our Illinois State fossil from the Maison Creek. Uh, this is Jack Wittry, uh, who is um, uh, very active in, again, both in what's called the Earth Science Club of Northern Illinois. And they have published these books by Jack on the Maison Creek fossil flora and the Maison Creek fossil fauna. Um, Next month, there's going to be a Maison Creek open house out at um, Kentigny. So I'll be, I'll be speaking there about the, the uh, sea anemone. So they're very important people there. So I, I'm going to stop there. Uh, I will mention again, uh, did I say I wrote a book? Yeah, I wrote a book, yeah. <laughs> uh, Explorers of Deep Time, Paleontologists and the History of Life. And again, I'm going to, I talk about, just to give you a two-second preface to the book, it is not a book about paleontology in the sense of you would you think about. It. It's a book about paleontologists. It's who we are, what, what we do, why we do it, why it's important to everybody. But it's also sort of a, it's a picture of the field. It's a snapshot of an academic discipline today. So I thank you, and I'm glad to answer any questions.